In this video, you are going to see an interview between myself and an unbelievable guest named Tommy Schmoot. Tommy is a high level thinker when it comes to the life insurance industry, has been in the industry for 30 plus years. And when I talk about someone that knows life insurance like the back of his hand, this is that person. So a lot of times when you look at YouTube channels, you will hear basic life insurance questions that just talk about base, PUA, death benefit, those types of basic questions, but we're gonna get into a very high level into the weeds with this individual. You are going to learn a ton and he's a very mature guest and he takes a stance on being very neutral in a lot of different scenarios, which I think comes with a lot of maturity over time. So I think you're gonna get a ton of value from him. Sit back, pick your feet up, grab the popcorn and enjoy. I know in the early eighties, uh, Guardian was the company that kind of made the innovation of like switching to, or at least creating the direct recognition company. Um, I'm just kind of curious, like the philosophy behind that. And like, if you think that that was actually a benefit to the industry as a whole, and if you actually prefer one over the other, you're not agnostic, I kind of would love to hear your thoughts around some of that stuff. Yeah. So, so just to sort of, for folks that are listening to this, to sort of set the stage, right? Mm -hmm. So direct recognition is a mechanism that's used to basically um, adjust dividends on loaned funds on policies. And all permanent life insurance policies have loan provisions. Um, you're not actually taking a loan against the policy. You're taking a loan from the carrier and the policy value is being used to collateralize that loan. And in the early 80s, when we saw rates go up to double digits, companies saw disintermediation. They had fixed loan interest rates, say, of 6%. The market was earning 12%. So people started to take loans out mm -hmm. and basically you had basically sort of a demand deposit situation. So companies had to figure out how do they inoculate themselves against this? And they really had one of two mechanisms. One was they could just switch to a variable loan interest rate that floated with prevailing market rates. The other was direct recognition and, and the way direct recognition works. And it can work with a fixed loan rate or a variable loan rate. But effectively what the company does is it adjusts the dividend that's paid out on loan funds to reflect what's happening in the prevailing market interest rate with the company could otherwise get relative to what they're charging on the loan. The theory behind direct recognition is because it's only done on loan funds, it basically is a more equitable treatment of all policyholders because companies, insurance companies, treat loans as a balance sheet asset because they're earning interest on those loans over over time and they earn a loan spread so my personal opinion about direct recognition is that as a mutual carrier because our job is to treat policyholders equitably based on their underwriting class etc direct recognition is actually the most equitable way to treat everyone and and the, the way i sometimes think about this is if you go to an extreme and you imagine everybody takes all their money out carrier a carrier b and carrier a is non-direct recognition um if everybody took all their money out the carrier all of a sudden has this run on the bank and they're, they're able to earn whatever their prevailing interest rate is and it may be lower than what their general account is because of prevailing rates and so that's dilutive to the general account carrier b has direct recognition same thing happens and this is an extreme right just to yeah, illustrate that. definitely Direct recognition basically would inoculate the carrier against the dilutive effect on the overall general account. So everybody's sort of getting treated equally. Um, so that's a long winded way, Dominic, of saying that from my perspective, and this is the reason Guardian went this path, is that direct recognition actually treats policyholders more equitably. Now, a lot of people think, well, no, 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 you're getting a lower dividend. That's not really true. Your dividend gets adjusted up or down based on your loan, the loan rate that you're being charged and what interest rates out are out in the market. So um, again, it's just it's about policyholder equity equity and equitability. So yeah. does that does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And uh, I heard a statistic that really only around like six percent of people are actually taking policy loans against their policies, uh, anyways, um, which would create the kind of the uh further of like let's make it more equitable for everybody if people are taking the loans right now i'm curious though because this is a huge debate in the industry and that's um, it's unfortunate that it is because i don't think it should be as a big of a debate as it is yeah. um but there's a lot of people that are like in the infinite banking space that are going to borrow against their policies to use for xyz activity sure. maybe they they don't 
care too much about the equity piece of it. They care more so to themselves, right? They're like, hey, like I want what's best for myself, knowing that I'm going to be using my policy for sure, for sure, right? Mm -hmm. In that instance, could you, would you argue, could you argue for them that it makes more sense to use a non-direct recognition carrier? Or would you still say that um, it's maybe indifferent in that it's still a, just as good to use it the other way? You know, it, it really, it, it's going to depend on the the circumstance. And what I mean by that is what's the prevailing market rate today versus what they're, the, the carrier's charging them and what the carrier does with their dividend if they, they're using direct recognition. So said another way, if you had taken a loan against your guardian policy in the past 10, 15 years, depending on the, the, the vintage of the policy, you were probably getting a higher dividend on your loan funds than you were on your non-loan funds. In fact, we had a lot of advisors coming to us and going, gee whiz, does that mean I should loan out all my policy so I get a higher dividend? Mm -hmm. The answer is no, because you're still creating drag on the policy mm -hmm. through the loan. Um, I say that all the way to answer your question, Dominic, is it really depends on what's happening with rates in market versus out of market. I'm familiar with infinite banking. I understand the theory, like theoretically, for any individual, it would sure seem like non-direct recognition is better, but depending on the, again, the interest rate circumstance, it may not it be advantageous to you. That That's, yeah. that's just the... the were, were you saying that the, if the loan rate is higher, and mm -hmm. I just want to maybe if this is a just a, a blanket statement, if the loan rate is higher than the dividend rate, then there's a good chance when the dividend adjusts on the borrowed funds, it'll be higher than the, the amount. Is that kind of what you're saying? It's actually the loan rate, the fixed loan rate. Let's take a guardian policy that has, yeah. let's say, a fixed loan rate of 8%. It's really seven and change because we're charging uh, uh, in advance. That's probably higher than what you would have been charged in a loan out in the market, right? Prevailing interest rates, which is call it four and a half on fixed income, right? Yeah. So you take a loan against your policy on, the, and let's say I have a policy with $100,000 of cash value. I take a $50,000 loan. That's now got a 7.4% interest rate. And Guardian's going to look at that and say, well, relative to what we would otherwise earn, that's much higher at 7.4% than what we're otherwise getting on fixed income. So we're going to adjust that portion of the client's dividend up to reflect that. Mm. No, um, that's good. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of lot of changes in the industry as a whole. And uh like yep. that is one that I I have found very fascinating. And I've had mm -hmm. to take some deep dive research under the hood and figure out like what's going on because yep. try to the more you know the more you can at least articulate it try on a, a basic level to clients because they really when they come into the industry they're so confused and so i try to gather oh, as totally. much information as possible and so like you've given a lot of really good insight there um i'm curious now for a, a new recent change as well that has happened um with the new 7702 rule change do you feel like that that has been a good change for the industry as a whole or do you feel like that um, it's, it really didn't make that much of a difference at the end of the day. So I, you know, so what I, I'm going to speak a little selfishly here, sort of a product yeah. nerd, right? <clears throat> what it did do for us is it gave us a lot more flexibility in how you can design products and optimize them to do what clients are looking for. Right. So it, it, previously there was basically a floor of 4% that you could price your whole life contracts on. Um, at least for the interest component of the guaranteed rates. Now there's a range, right? Mm -hmm. And so depending on what interest rate you use, a policy can be either more tilted towards accumulation or more tilted towards death benefit um, optimization. Yeah. There's not a better or worse. But what it, And this is why you're seeing now carriers come out with products that have various underlying interest rates because they're trying to build products that optimize for what consumers what clients are really looking for a client that may be looking for like a, a whole life policy for an executive bonus plan maybe they want more cash accumulation so you're setting that rate lower to allow cash value to grow faster a client that's maybe doing a uh, just a simple estate plan maybe they want they're focused on death benefit so the higher interest rate is better for them set lower etc so Again, what I guess that's all to say from a selfish perspective, I think what it's done is it's given the industry a lot more flexibility in how they can design. For advisors, I know it's tougher because it's like, oh my God, now I got to figure out which product am I going to use? But we, we now have more solutions sort of in our tool belt.
Yeah, that's great. And so would you say that in general, I think you, you did mention it, but I kind of wanted to know if we're comparing company to company, maybe it's too hard. Maybe you're comparing apples to oranges, but yep. if I'm a, a consumer uh-huh. and I know that one carrier A has a 2% guarantee and you, you mentioned that the lower the guarantee, the more cash accumulation there's likely to be. And then another carrier is at a 3.75% guarantee and accumulation is my goal. I should more than likely look to the 2% just due to the sheer fact of that it should accumulate more cash value futuristically. That's that's t- that's typically the way we've seen these designed, Dominic, and typically what you'll also see. And again, the market's still evolving. Right? Carriers mm-hmm. are still introducing products because we're only a year into this. You'll see like short pay designs with, with lower interest rates so you can pump more premium in. Premiums are typically higher but you get more cash value in return. So that client that's looking to say, uh, have a supplemental source of uh, savings for retirement income, that can be a really, really powerful tool for them. Yeah. From a a nerdy, geeky insurance standpoint, why is it though that the lower the guarantee is, the more cash accumulation the policy should perform relative to the guarantee being higher, being more death benefit focused? Oh, no worries. Keep so from a, like a, into the weeds, like insurance nerd type of standpoint of like, why, why is that the case that if it's a 2% guarantee, it is more focused on a cash accumulation than like a 375 is, is less focused on cash accumulation. Like, like why is, why is that with the functionality behind it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the, the way I would oversimplify this is the lower interest rate means that your guaranteed cash value <clears throat> is going to grow at a lower, steeper slope, right? And all whole life policies at the endowment age, which is typically age 121, your guaranteed cash value goes to your death benefit. But what you're basically doing is shifting that curve out. And because less of the value is being pushed towards guarantees, there's basically more juice in there to price into dividends. So you'll see the current values of the right side of the ledger tend to accumulate more rapidly. I'm oversimplifying it, but that's the way to think about it. So essentially you have less guarantees at the beginning. And by having less guarantees at the beginning, you're promising less at the beginning, which allows more cash to be able to get pushed into it to supercharge it type of deal. You you basically, yeah, you basically would end up what's happening is there's more to, to play with in terms of dividends that can be paid back. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, the whole dividend thing, I think, mm-hmm. is very confusing for a lot of people in the industry. And, and I say that sure. because a lot of people just come in and they they talk about dividends as like that's the the return on someone's cash value, right? It's mm-hmm. like mass mutual six percent, guardians mm-hmm. five six five. It's like this is the return you're gonna get on your policy. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to why the insurance industry is has numbers like that like they just have like this scale dividend scale when it really has no correlation to the actual value of the policy in itself it's 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 the sixty four thousand dollar question it's kind of we all know like the dir from carrier to carrier is kind of meaningless to the client but yet we continue to wave it in each other's face and what really matters is if you're looking if you're comparing an illustration to an illustration understand that an illustration is just a hypothetical you really want to look at your cash value and death benefit internal rates of return that's how you see the entire death uh, excuse me, the entire dividend manifesting itself because as you know the dividend's got three components it's got a mortality component it's got a, a loading component or expense component and then it's got an investment component or the interest component which is the dir and so people see that number and they think oh that's my rate of return on the policy it has could be anything further from the truth right um but for some reason, companies, all of them, uh, Guardian included, talk about their DIR and they use them to compare, even though they're oftentimes apples and oranges because where companies park some of their investment expenses are different between carriers. So I wish I had a better answer for you than that, but that's just that's the truth. Um, and like I say, if I'm sitting with an advisor or an, sometimes advisors ask us to sit with clients to help pick apart an illustration, we look at cash value uh, and div- death benefit internal rates of return because that's really how you see what's what the the sort of the overall performance of the policies projected to be. No, I love that. That's good. I, I try to articulate the same thing to the to our clients, and so I'm glad that you've uh, 
solidified what I've I've been saying uh, to hear from somebody else that's a lot smarter than myself. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, th this this other question that I have is you brought up is you brought out this endowment number uh, age 121, mm -hmm. um, and people's death benefit is equal to the cash value at this point. Um, so the the question I have, and this is um, maybe for advisors listening, it could be more elementary, but I think for a lot of consumers, they they get really confused around this this conversation of when I die, I only get the death benefit and I don't get the cash value and the death benefit. And so like, is there a way you could easily articulate like why that's the case, why you don't get both and why you only get the death benefit? And maybe if it has something to do as well with the endowment at 121, where they equal each other and they all correlate with each other, if you could just give some insight to kind of that whole conversation, that'd be amazing. Yeah. So, so the way I think about this, Dominic, and this may not be the answer that people like to hear, but <clears throat> it's just the, the way I've thought about it as I, as I learned the business is your cash value has a, there's a technical term of art for it. It's your, it's called your non forfeiture value. And so we went back way, 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 way back in time. There weren't cash values in life insurance policies the way there are today. And, you know, you look at other types of insurance like disability insurance, or sometimes long-term care insurance, they don't have cash values. There's no non-forfeiture benefit there. But life insurance there is, and that's because the regula regulators said, look, gee whiz, we, we want people, if they walk away from their policies and they've paid premiums, to get something. So that's where cash value and non-forfeiture values originally sort of came in. <clears throat> Today, when at least traditional permanent life, whole life policies are priced, they're priced such that the premium, if paid each year, on, is guaranteed to not change and the death benefit to not change. Now, you can earn dividends like if they're declared and that'll give you some upside and you can do a lot of things with those dividends, but putting dividends aside, that's, that's the underlying foundation of the whole life policy. And so for that to work, because insurance stops, it used to be age 100, now it's age 121 actuarially. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> for that to work, then basically the carrier has to have accumulated enough value that the policies fully endowed, meaning all the reserve they were putting up to make the promises at each age have been basically topped up by the client's premiums. And that's that's just sort of the basic underlying actuarial principle of uh, building a you know a truly truly endowment policy, which whole life is. There are other types of insurance out there that aren't that way, like universal life. Right? You can pay a you've got open ended sort of premiums that you can pay, but uh, a whole life policy is fundamentally an endowment policy, which means it's got those underlying guarantees, and as a result the cash value has to equal the death benefit. Mm -hmm. it, and again, that cash value is there regulatorily so that there's a non-forfeiture value if the client decides they want to surrender their policy somewhere down the road. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Uh, very well. I appreciate that. You, you mentioned, uh, which I'm glad you kind of pivoted a little to it at the mm -hmm. end, is you brought up the word index universal life. And I really would love to hear your thoughts around it. And I, and I say this, um, in a banter way, because there's so many people in the space that are either far left, IULs are terrible and whole life is the best or the opposite where it's yeah. IULs are the best, whole life is the worst. So I'm curious, and you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You could be one or the other agnostic. Like I would love to hear your perspective on good, bad, uglies, like kind of where you're at, your stances on this, the, the yeah, part, part sure. of the whole. Sure. Yeah. So um, indexed universal life is just a, a flavor of universal life. I actually own a universal life policy in addition to whole life policies myself. So I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with universal life. I think where <clears throat> these contracts become challenging or problematic is if the advisor and client don't understand all the underlying moving parts and there are a lot more in universal life contracts inherently whether it be a traditional fixed universal life contract an index universal life contract or a variable universal life contract the premiums aren't fixed so the client can move them around the cost of insurance can move right um, there are guarantees but they can move significantly and we've seen that happen with carriers changing costs of insurance um, obviously your crediting rate can move I think the challenge that has ha happened with Index Universal Life, which is one of the fastest growing products in the industry, 
is that early on, not dissimilar to what we saw with variable and universal life contracts back in the 2000s, the, the illustrated crediting rates were maybe, probably, um, uh, too rosy for what the future, the, what the, the reality really was. Mm -hmm. And so people didn't really appreciate year in and year out what they might actually get. And so, you know, look, life insurance is a long-term promise. It's about expectation management. Mm -hmm. And so I think what ended up happening is a lot of people's expectations weren't met. And so a lot of people ended up getting disappointed because they thought they were going to get one thing and they got another thing. That's not always the case. Lots of advisors out there quickly understood what these things were about, illustrated them conservatively. And I still think the product, if illustrated and, and managed the right way, can be a very, very powerful planning tool. Guardian actually has on its whole life contracts an indexed participation feature mm -hmm. that allows you to sort of benefit um, from sort of equity returns in sort of a similar way. Um, not equity returns, but equity linked returns in a similar way. But that's all to say is like, there's no bad insurance contract out there. It's really how complex are they? And then how sophisticated is the advisor that's presenting and managing them? And how savvy is the consumer to understand what they're buying? It's certainly mm -hmm. more complex than a whole life contract, which is really premium cash value, death benefit guarantees. Simple. Yeah. So if I was a consumer and I came to you uh, and I was like, hey, and I'm, I'm in this space, I'm trying to learn. I heard this IUL is this really awesome thing. And then I hear this whole whole life product can is really good as well. Like, it, what, what would you, like, what product would you essentially, if they said, hey, which one should I go with? Like, what are some reasons why they would go with one over the other? Yeah, so at the end of the day, I, and I say this to every advisor and client, um, and it's not to dodge your, first is, it's, who is the advisor you're working with someone you trust, right? Because mm -hmm. they're the ones that are going to have to make a lot of the tough decisions for you because they're like your doctor, right? They're, they're presenting complex concepts to you and they're the ones that's sorting through the weeds. And we talked about it at the beginning of our conversation, trust-based business. From a product selection perspective, then it comes down to what's the client really trying to accomplish? And if, if and I think this is true for most clients that we see, if the client is really focused on protecting their family or their business, planning for estate taxes, planning for estate equalization, planning for business continuity, and they're looking for something that provides more set it and forget it, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. then whole life is typically more like that. There's less that can go, I don't want to say off the rails, there's less, there are less switches. If a client's looking for something where they can um, minimum fund, maximum fund, like you can do that with whole life and paid up additions, maybe maybe indexed UL is, is right for you, right? Um, but just know that you're going to have to do a lot more with your advisor to manage that, con typically that contract year in and year out to make sure that it accomplishes what you set out to do. So all that is to say, it's, it's a matter of the advisor and then the client's sort of, um, uh, I don't want to say risk aversion, but they're they're biased towards how much work do they want to have to do to manage this plan once it's been put in place. Because unfortunately, again, what mm -hmm. ends up happening with a lot of index products in particular is maybe people will underfund them or illustrate a high rate, and then they find out later on, oh, gee whiz, I've got to change my premium outlay to get back on track with where I wanted to be. And it's, it's not the same thing that you'll find with a whole life contract. So that's that's my perspective. Mm. And that was probably one of the biggest problems with the the UL back in the early what eighties and stuff is that they they That's just right. weren't being funded and designed properly, and now they get twenty thirty years later and they're like, wow, like I got to put in three times the amount of money just so this thing doesn't lapse. And and you've got a client that's largely either maybe uninsurable or much less insurable. This is a key part of their plan, and they're stuck. It's really it's it's it's, it's quite fortunate. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm curious from kind of sticking on this index universal life slash whole life, like in just kind of strategies in general, there's a, kind of a hot conversation of, of strategy that just came out. I would say when the interest rate environment was a lot lower, it was definitely more prevalent. Um, but there's this thing called premium finance um, that is really becoming like this sexy conversation of, of how I can leverage the bank to pay for my premiums. Uh -huh. um, I'm curious in, in your uh, professional opinion, 
in all interest rate environments, do you feel like that that is a, a plausible strategy or do you feel like only in like lower interest rate environments is good? Or do you actually feel like there's just too much danger as a whole that too much can go wrong where it may not be the best suit for, I would say 99% of people. Yeah. So, so, um, it's a lot of, a couple of questions in there. One is, you know, who's the right client Two, does it work well in <clears throat> all interest rates environments or does it get worse in certain interest rate environments? Certainly as interest rates go up, the potential leverage that you may get becomes very different. But, um, I think the most important question is actually that first one that you asked Dominic, like who's the, who, who's the profile client for this type of planning guardian has a premium finance platform that we have today um, that we work with our advisors on and we certainly believe there are clients where premium finance makes a lot of sense for the client because the client has a lot of illiquid assets maybe they're in the real estate market for example they have a very large insurance need. They have an exposure. If they die, something bad will happen to their business and their holdings. But because of their liquidity profile, premium finance is maybe one of the most effective ways, mm -hmm. either temporarily or medium term, to actually put in an insurance program to make sure if something bad happens in the near to medium term, they're protected. Their business is protected. Their holdings are protected because they just don't have the liquidity profile. I think the challenge that we see is that this same technique has been used in situations and you see like free insurance programs out there where people are saying, Hey, you know, you can borrow at this rate and get credited at this rate and you never have to come out of pocket. I've never seen anything in my life that works like that forever. Right. I mean, if, if, if you and I could do that, Dominic, like I would say, let's hang up the phone right now and let's go do that. Right. Mm -hmm. But we, we know that's not true. So I think that, that that's probably the dangerous thing that I've seen out there in the marketplace. I do, like I said, I do think as rates go up, generally a lot of the um, financing deals that people can get out there are tougher. But it, again, for the right client, particularly those that have really strong balance sheets, but are often highly illiquid, this is often just, it's sometimes the only way they can actually put the insurance program they, they need, at least in the short to medium term. So that's the way I think about it. Mm, that's good. So it sounds like what you're saying is that as long as they're the right fit uh, and they have the right port, you know, profile in regards to like this product, then it, it could make a lot of sense. And then 99% of other people should obviously stay away from it. And then there's there's some other things out there as well of like, there are some, I want to say slimy, you could use whatever words you want, but misleading mm -hmm. information in regards to like putting money into a, a policy, borrowing mm -hmm. from that policy to like make future premiums going forward and not putting any more money into it ever again, staying away from stuff like that is probably a good idea. Yeah. I mean, th th those types of schemes are built on um, it, infinite leverage, infinite arbitrage. And if there's one thing we know, like history has taught us that that doesn't exist, that that's, may look, you may see it on a piece of paper, but in reality, those types of things just don't, don't last forever. And it, when you're dealing with a contract, a promise that's 20 or 30 years long, you know, um, you, you got to think twice when you see things like that. Mm, that's good. Um, I kind of want to stay on this advanced, you know, as we kind of come to the tail end of things, this whole advanced, sure. you know, strategies or products. I actually am not super familiar with it. And so I'd love to hear from you is um, what is uh, like private placement insurance and like, how does that work and who is that for? Yeah, so private placement insurance is, <clears throat> you see less and less of it today, but to answer your question directly, it's typically a much more sophisticated set of investment structures, like a think of variable universal life that have mutual funds in them. Um, but instead of mutual funds, you may have hedge funds. Um, so you have to have an accredited investor purchasing these things. And typically what's happening is you have a client who's um, looking to, in addition to access these types of investment structures, get the tax benefits that you get from life insurance. Because as you know, there's no inside build, tax on inside buildup uh, um, on a life insurance contract. So it's sort of mashing these th two things together. Um, I, you know, gosh, Dominic, there's probably only a couple of carriers left out there today that actually write these contracts now. Hmm. Um, they've become under a lot of regulatory scrutiny um, because um, regulators and, and uh, elected officials are starting to say, gee whiz, is this really what life insurance is intended to do? 
um, to be determined how that actually plays out. What I will say is, is that, you know, there are probably only you know, dozens of these contracts that are consummated in a given year um, because they are for a very, very select type of, like you'd say that I think the term of art is an accredited investor, somebody who's going to invest in a hedge fund, large sums, they probably already are invested in the hedge funds and they're looking to get a portion of that in sort of basically an insurance contract for the tax properties. We at Guardian don't manufacture private placement life insurance. Um, you know, I'd say 80% to 90% of our premiums sold today are just plain old vanilla whole life contracts. Okay. So it's not, it's not in relation to anything like business related uh, individuals or businesses as in like bull eye, coal eye. It's just completely different for the individual who wants to essentially invest, quote unquote, into something like a hedge fund, but have the wrapper of life insurance. That's right. Now there are you. I have seen, and this is going back many, many, many years ago, Dominic. Uh, Coley plans, which are corporate-owned life insurance ins contracts. This is basically using life insurance to fund non-qualified deferred compensation or other executive benefits. Private placement versions of those, right? So, literally, companies that are looking to use hedge funds as the investment vehicle in a Coley plan, but there ain't many of them. Right. Um, I remember back, I can't, I haven't seen any recently. Um, hmm. Do you, uh, do you see the, the trajectory of kind of the, the whole executive bonus plan, the split dollar cases, do you find that to be something that is still prevalent in the space or do you find it to be something that is kind of declining in nature? I would say from our perspective, it's probably one of the greatest opportunities in the marketplace is, you know, um, Business planning using life insurance is, while it's more complex than just sort of typical individual planning, it's a really powerful set of planning concepts that for business owners can really add value to them and their employees. Um, the challenge is, is that it requires a little more acumen from the advisor. Um, and so having advisors out there like yourself that understand how these plans work and it, it's less about the product in that situation, right? You can use whole life in these these plans all the time. It's more about the the advisor helping understand what the client's objective is. Like if it's trying to retain key employees, particularly in small, closely held businesses, where if you lose one or two key employees, you're really in trouble. These types of programs can be really, really powerful retention and bonusing tools. Um, and also bring with them a lot of tax benefits that life insurance does as well, and a lot of liquidity benefits that permanent life insurance does. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, these are this is some of our biggest opportunity and one of the places where a lot of guardian advisors uh, focus a lot of their time on because it's a differentiating value add in the marketplace. Amazing. Tommy, I, I'm somebody who likes to keep schedule because I definitely know you're somebody who is... Uh, very to the T with time restraints and uh i don't want to go over time with the, your calendar and so um being at the top of the hour um i feel like it would be respectful to kind of stop here even though i could go on this for another 30 minutes to an hour for sure um but i well, want to say thank it was, you. yeah it's great meeting you yeah no it was it was a pleasure thank you for watching this interview with tommy if you have any questions or you want to talk to somebody on the team please click below to go to our and asset vault Please click subscribe. Till next time.